Good evening, SPC participants. We are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll probably have a few people join us over the next few minutes, so we'll go ahead and start with some hellos and introductions, but it is seven, so we'll get started. And tonight we're going to have Dr. Jackie Adkins discuss breeding and genetics and a bit of genomics and all of that wrapped into one brief one hour lesson for you all. And at the beginning, though, we're going to have Chip answer a handful of questions that we had proposed from this last month's assignments. So we'll let him take it away from here. Thank you, Bailey. And as always, if you have questions, uh, just go down to the question spot and type that in and we'll watch for those as we go through the evening. Um, yeah, we've got a lot to cover, so I'll try to be fairly brief. I want to give you a couple updates. One, if you were to visit the Junior Simmental site and then go to, of course, the SPC page, that CAF data from December has just been uploaded today. Now, the only data that's been updated is weight and gain and feed information, so none of the cost data is in there yet. Uh, but if you want to see how your calf uh, is doing and, and compare that to the other animals, uh, you can take a look. And so um, uh, just a heads up, for the month of December, um, just some interesting factoids. Average feed intake across the SPC steers was just shy of 25 pounds a day. Um, average daily gain for the entire month of December uh, was about 476. So slowed down for a few of them there late in the month. And so um, just, just some points of interest. You can look and see how your calves compare to that uh, 4.76 average daily gain for the month of December. And then our conversion rate or how many feeds to a pound to gain, um, 5.37 pounds to a pound to gain is kind of where we were sitting as roughly an average. And there's a wide range in that feed to gain and that's an as fed feed to gain. You can also see uh, dry matter if you want to look. So let me give you a heads up that that is there. If you want to go view it, I encourage you to do that. There's a lot of information buried in that data. Also, uh, Bailey mentioned there were a handful of points uh, to mention, a couple questions, a handful of uh, things to point out. One, I just want to say I appreciate uh, all the work that, that you all as participants are doing, and certainly for the juniors, we know that there's some parents helping a little bit. Uh, just remind us to uh, parents you're going to need to help in cases uh, don't over help um, just make sure we uh, we understand that the younger folks are going to have a, a, a sort of a different spin on things and that's okay and that's cool and and we want to see that and so uh, that's perfectly acceptable three specific questions uh, came to us that need to be addressed and so I wanted to throw these out and in particular they really all kind of bounce around the area of, of genetics and so it's quite possible that Dr. Atkins might bump into some of these as she goes into some of her conversations as well and so the question is really in no particular order. Uh, one question was and actually I'm going to combine two questions here because they're essentially about the same. Uh, one was relative to feeder calves, why aren't EPDs um, more widely used as buying tools for feeder calves? And then the other question that's similar is, why don't my calves sell at the sale barn for the same number that the FPC predicts? And I, actually, these are, a bit, these are kind of flip sides of the same coin. The knowledge of genetic awareness in the marketing and feedlot space has grown tremendously in the last five to six years. But clearly, it is not that the space where it's probably going to be another five years in terms of understanding genetics of feeder calves and not only understanding it, but demanding that knowledge. And so you all are, are you're trendsetters. You're on the front side of the curve looking at this stuff. And so there are certainly sale barns out there that are very progressive in their use of data tools like EPDs and indexes, tools like the feeder profit calculator to help highlight the value of calves. And there are sale barns that are very good at that. Unfortunately, that may or may not be your sale barn, and that's a conversation to have with mom and dad, and there's some implications of that. Um, but with the work of some of these sophisticated sale barns, platforms like Superior Livestock Auctions, this is moving and moving pretty fast. And so I would suspicion by the time most of you uh, graduate to the next phase of your lives, there's going to be a lot more knowledge expected on the genetics of calves going through sale facilities 
and I suspect you'll be paid a little bit uh, accordingly. Whether that means it's a premium or an added discount may be more likely for the cats who don't live up to the others, whose time will tell on those things. So great questions, very thoughtful and thought for provoking questions there. And then the last question that was brought up, again, is a genetics question, Jackie, so I kind of plant the seed with you. Um, why aren't Akaushi or Boss Indicus type cattle used to a higher degree to capture heterosis or marbling or other benefits like that? And so some of you may or may not be familiar with those terminologies. So if you're not, Boss Indicus cattle, typically in our part of the world, we would think of Boss Indicus cattle as being Brahmin cattle. They are in parts of the world, there are other versions of Boss Indicus cattle. They're cattle that originate from the subcontinent of India. That's what the Indicus means. Um, and in this country, the most prevalent of those are the Brahmin based cattle. Brahmin themselves or Brangus or beef masters are those different degrees. And those cattle do do a great job of bringing some heterotic benefits, crossbreeding benefits. Uh, they themselves do not marble very well. That's actually a fairly significant challenge for them. And so they sometimes are penalized a little bit because it's easy to identify them. Sometimes there are some questions about their ability to marble at the same level as some other breeds. Um, and so there are some concerns there. Uh, but sometimes those concerns at the feeder calf level can be offset by the crossbreeding benefits that you get in terms of a longevity minded cow maybe some added growth benefit in some calves. So um, those, those cattle are used to a pretty high degree. They're fairly regionally located though. Um, you need the benefits of those cattle in areas where the weather is hot, but typically it has to be hot and humid and they have an ability to tolerate those sort of environments and insect and pests and disease loads that some other cattle just aren't as good at. And so sometimes they're pretty heavily used in those regions. Boss Indicus type cattle are likely not going to be as heavily used as you get farther north in the country. The other breed that was mentioned was Akaushi, and this is another breed that many of you may not be familiar with. And I'm going to lump in yet another breed with them that sometimes is thought of in kind of the same vein, and that would be Wagyu's. Akaushi and Wagyu's are terminologies used for different subset of Japanese based cattle. Um, interestingly enough, you may or may not know. Most all of the Japanese cattle actually go back to the same breed types that you and I are familiar with here in the United States. They were just isolated in pockets uh, geographically around Japan many, many generations ago. And so were bred slightly differently. And Akushi and Wagyu's would be um, an example of those things. And both of those breeds are highly sought after from a marketing standpoint for their ability to marble. The challenge is neither one of those breeds at this point has a tremendous amount of scientific data uh, that is done in a multi-breed fashion where we can actually effectively compare their genetic prowess for carcass merit or growth, et cetera, relative to some of the more mainstream breeds in this country. So yeah, it's widely believed, and, and I think there's some merit to it, that those cattle do marble quite well. We need more data to really prove how effective they are relative to some of the breeds you're more familiar with. And then the other component is how much do they trade growth, meaning they typically don't seem to grow quite as well as mainstream breeds. How much growth do they get back? And so where's the profit point? It's not just about total marbling, it's about profit. And sometimes that might mean giving back a little bit of marbling to get some more growth. So um, great questions though, and pretty thoughtful questions. And so I appreciate those. With that, I'm gonna be quiet. Uh, Jackie, that tells me that the young folks are thinking about genetics, and that's awesome. That's your wheelhouse. I'll be quiet and turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Kip. And for a few seconds, I'm going to share my camera just so you guys have a face to go with the name. I wish I could see your faces, um, but uh, appreciate the chance to visit with you tonight. And um, hats off to you guys for being a part of this program. It's a uh, really unique uh, opportunity. And um, what I think it shows to me is that you are willing to really engage and commit to a very rare portion of the industry that very few people actually engage and commit in. And um, so well done and love to hear the genetics talks. I actually shortened this talk, so I cut out 
crossbreeding and hybrid vigor, but maybe we can figure out a way to bring those back. And um, of course, one of the, the, the um, well, so you get two big things from crossbreeding. One is hybrid vigor, which we can talk about a little bit more if there are some questions there, but the other is breed complementarity. And I think that really hit on some of the, um, uh, the things that Chip was talking about is you need to balance between more marbling, but it takes longer to finish. And so uh, the way you can use crossbreeding effectively is by choosing breeds that provide um, complementary uh, traits to that crossbred calf. And so sometimes um, you can go in the wrong direction. So you wanna be thoughtful with your crossbreeding, uh, but it, it absolutely adds a tremendous benefit in, in particular to some traits that are hard to select and get see improvement with lowly heritable traits like fertility. There is a tremendous benefit there. Um, so I am sorry, but I am going to stop sharing my camera because my internet is really slow. And I think if I share my camera, you're going to lose my audio. So I'm going to stop sharing the camera um, and just focus on walking you through this presentation. Um, at any point, if there are questions, please ask them. Um, this is a tough topic to tackle in an evening or in a one hour session or 40 minute session. It's also a tough topic to tackle across a variety of um, ages and ex expertise that are seen in this group of um, SPC participants. So anyway, I tried to, um, to break things down as much as possible while keeping things interesting as well. Um, but if I skip over something or go too fast or didn't hit a topic that you want to learn more about, please ask and we'll try and cover that. So hopefully you all can see my screen and hopefully my computer works because we've been fighting this afternoon. <laughs> um, so why should you all care about animal breeding and genetics? Uh, this is a good place to start. It's important to just pause and think about the very long-term consequences of choosing your genetics this year. What, what, that, what that decision has for your herd for years to come. In a lot of scenarios, if, if people are using a bull this year to create replacement females that will be born next year and kept in the herd, they could be there in that herd in the year 2036. Now just pause for a second and think about that. Think about what you might be doing differently 15 years from now. Or think about what you were doing 15 years previously. Some of you weren't even born. And, um, you know, when I think about myself 15 years ago, I was, um, I had moved to Missouri and was working through graduate school. I was newly married. I didn't have the three kids that I now have. We, we've gone, we've lived in two different homes since then. I've had three different cars since then. I've had three different dogs since 2006. So a lot has changed in my life. But if I had bred a, ca a cow in 2006 to a certain bull and kept those replacements, I would still have those genetics influencing my herd today. So it's a big decision. It's big. And because it's such a big decision and can have such a long impact in your herd, you really need to do your homework this, with this and be intentional. And we tend to focus on the sire. Of course, choosing uh, females is also important. But one of the reasons why we focus so heavily on the sire is that between the sire and the maternal sire, or, you know, the, the the grand sire on the maternal side, that's 75% of the genetics in the herd. If you go one, one 
um, level back, it's almost 90%, it's 87% of the genetics of your herd are composed by those animals. So a lot of emphasis should be placed on the sire and of course replacement females as well. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why we get a little bull centric. So why are EPDs and indexes such an important part of this equation? Um, and I would take a step back and say, one of the first things you need to do when you're making a genetic selection decision is to assess your herd in areas that you want to improve on. And a lot of those areas would be traits that are influenced by multiple different genes, and multiple different factors. And there's no other more accurate tool to make an improvement in a polygenic trait or a trait that's influenced by multiple genes than an EPD. There just is no other tool. There's no debate among people who study genetics and animal breeding, no debate whatsoever that EPDs are the, the most accurate tool to make progress in a given trait. In fact, it's quoted as being seven to 10 times more effective than, you, than using an actual measurement um, to, to make progress. And so when you're trying to make a change, the most accurate tool that you're using to make a change in the right direction is going to get you there faster, period. Uh, selection indexes are something that we'll talk about during this uh, talk towards the end of it, but indexes take multiple economically relevant traits, traits that influence the profit center of a herd. And it combines that into one number. So an index uses the EPDs to, um, to come up with one dollar figure or profit figure in the end. So there's no debate, EPDs and indexes are what you wanna be using. Um, you can combine these in a variety of ways and we won't really get into that, but please, please, please pay attention to these genetic tools. So we have a laundry list of things we're gonna try and do today and um, it's a big list and so we'll try and get through this as fast as possible. Uh, we wanna talk through just how things are inherited, how are ge genetics passed on from one generation to the next, what a phenotype is and what influences it. Um, what is the term heritability? It's something we hear a lot about. We're gonna talk about what that really means. And, and we'll work through an example of how simple traits are inherited and how you can predict um, progeny outcomes with simple traits. Um, then we'll jump into some more complicated things. We'll talk about how to use an APD and um, possible change, which is related to accuracy and percentile ranking. So these are numbers that you would see in herd book and it'd be great if you all had a really firm understanding of what those numbers really mean. Um, and how, how does genomics factor into this? What is the utility of DNA testing as it relates to genetic selection and the EPD? Um, we'll touch on economic selection indexes. And then along the way, I've added some questions that are kind of myths or frequently asked questions that we hear a lot about. So like I said, it's kind of a big list, but we'll try and make through, make it through as much as possible. So here's the key to uh, inheritance of genetic information. Um, so cattle have 30 pairs of chromosomes that are found in the nucleus of nearly every single cell in the body. There's a few exceptions like the sperm cell and the um, egg or the ova only have half. Of, of the genetic makeup, uh, but nearly every single cell has the exact same um, DNA found in the nucleus of the cell. And uh, cattle inherit one chromosome from each parent. So 30 pairs of chromosome, one 
chromosome comes from the sire and a complementary chromosome comes from the dam. And with these chromosomes, if you picture a really long string or yarn and you crumple it up real tight, you can make it into a really compact um, little ball. And that's kind of how these chromosomes are structured in the nucleus of the cell. But if you unwind that, that string, that ball of yarn, and make it into a string, along that string are, are chunks of DNA. So these um, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, um, have four different varieties, four different nucleotides uh, that you'll learn about in different science classes. Um, it's not important to know or memorize what these are, but just to understand that the sequence of those different nucleotides is the key to gen genetic variation. And cattle share the vast majority of the sequence is identical from one animal to the next. But there are areas along this DNA that um, has maybe a different uh, nucleotide there. And that variation in the nucleotide sequence is what causes um, genetic differences. OK, so how does that happen? There are certain chunks of the DNA that are called genes that are made into or um, that are code, that end up coding an RNA molecule. And that RNA molecule is the kind of recipe for the sequence of amino acids that gets that get put together in proteins. So what does all that mean? Why is that important? Proteins are the workhorse of the cell. Different proteins that function differently can do things faster, or maybe they can't do the function at all. And so the cell has to find a different way to get that process done. So changes in the DNA sequence in a gene can cause changes in the functionality of the protein. And that's really how the different DNA sequence can cause differences in performance. Um, so we all, humans included, have two copies of every gene, one, one on each chromosome from each parent, with the exception of the sex chromosome, so they're slightly different. Um, you can have different versions of the same gene, so different versions of the same location of a specific chromosome, but maybe have a different sequence. And those different versions can function differently. And so those are called alleles. An animal who is, has two of the same alleles is called homozygous. And an animal with two different alleles is called heterozygous. Uh, so a phenotype is the observable characteristics of an individual. Um, it could be coat color, it could be height. Um, it's anything that we can observe. A lot of what we talk about are animal records, birth weights, uh, calving ease um, scores, uh, pregnancy status. All of those are phenotypes. And genotype is referring to the genetic makeup of an animal. So the phenotype, the observable characteristic, is influenced by the genotype, the genetic makeup, and also the environment. Um, so here's a picture. This is my mom's family. My mom is right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. She's the one to, uh, third one in from the right. And she, had, she grew up in a small town just right. You could walk to South Dakota from my grandparents' house. So it's right on the border between North and South Dakota. And she had, um, there were nine siblings in this family. So nine kids came out of these two individuals, Joe and Hazel Manning. And uh, they all came from the same 
uh, gene pool. They all came from half of Hazel's genetics and half of Joe's genetics, but they ended up being various sizes, various hair color, various eye colors. Some had glasses, some didn't. They have very different tastes, very different personalities. Um, some of that is because they inherited different genes from Joe and Hazel Manning than their siblings did. And some of it is because despite the fact that they were a part of the same household, they weren't raised in the exact same environment, right? There's birth order, the older ones had a slightly different environment than the younger ones. But even um, my mother and her twin sister, Leah, twin sister raised in the same, you know, exact same time had a lot of differences. And those differences are in part due to different genetic makeup of them, of these two sisters that were twins, but they were fraternal twins. And even though they were born at the same time, they still had slightly different um, exposures and things that influenced uh, their appearance and their personality. So um, sometimes you'll hear things about bulls that, you know, kind of downplay uh, the genetics or the EPD because their calves are so different. Well, you should expect differences in bull calves. You just should. We see it in humans all the time. And sometimes we sort of forget that the same thing is going to hold true with calves. So the degree that the phenotype is explained or controlled by the genetic makeup versus the environmental makeup is called heritability. And we'll talk about that here next. So heritability explains how much of the variation in the phenotype is explained by the variation in the genetics for that trait. Um, and it ranges from zero to one, where one would be highly heritable. So the genetics have a large influence on the phenotype. Uh, and those are traits that are easier to make progress by selecting on a phenotype. Um, because if you select on the phenotype and the phenotype is highly related to the genetics, um, genetic influence of, of that trait, then you'll be selecting on those genetics at the same time. But lowly heritable traits have a small um, influence, uh, or the genetics have a small influence, and so they're largely um, influenced by the environmental uh, effects. And those are hard to make progress when you're selecting um, on a phenotype, very, very hard. So fertility is a prime example of a lowly heritable trait and something that people talk about a lot that they they must have the best genetics for fertility because they call they call all their open cattle. Well, if that phenotype of being open is largely influenced by the environment, then you might not be making the genetic product progress that you think you're making um, by simply culling open cattle. It's really best in those traits to use an EPD. So um, simply inherited traits are traits that are controlled by just a few genes, one or two genes. Uh, we often talk about a dominant and a recessive allele. A, a dominant allele, the animal only needs one copy of that allele to display the dominant uh, phenotype for that trait. The dominant allele would mask the recessive allele. So it, even though it might carry a recessive allele, we don't see it when we look at the phenotype of the animal. A recessive allele, um, the animal would need to have two copies of the recessive allele in order to display the recessive condition. So here's a very common example of dominant and recessive alleles in cattle. So the extension locus, or it's called MC1R locus, is a gene that controls the inheritance of red or, coat, red or black coat color. 
black or big E is dominant to red, little e. So if you look at this picture of these two calves, one is red, one is black, um, just pause and see if you can figure out what the genotype of this red calf is or what the genotype of the black calf is. And it's too hard to get you guys to speak, so I just want you to pause for a second and think about it. Okay, so hopefully, if we know that um, red is recessive, and that means that an animal has to carry two copies of the red allele in order to display a red coat color, then this calf on the left here would have to be homozygous red. But the calf on the left, since black is dominant, the calf can carry one black gene and it would mask a red gene or it could carry two black genes. So we really don't know this calf on the right. We don't know without testing the DNA whether or not that animal is black or a homozygous black with two copies of the black allele or heterozygous with one copy of the black and one copy of the red. Now I will say I have oversimplified this. So there's another, um, there's another allele option for this gene that's called a wild type, and that is um, intermediate between red and black. And there's um, some nuances with the wild type gene. Um, so if you guys have any questions on that, we can sure talk about that um, in further detail. Okay, so a really useful tool to work through simple uh, traits like coat color as a Punnett square. Uh, and you can use this for um, genetic conditions that you might be tracking or anything that's simply inherited, um, hold and uh, horned or um, uh, dilution, coat color dilution, any of the genetic uh, defects that we track or genetic conditions, you can, you can uh, pencil out a Punnett square to figure out the outcomes of mating two individuals together. So um, how does it work? Well, we've talked about the fact that we get half of our genetics um, from our um, dam or mom and half from the sire or our dad. So with every sperm cell or egg cell, that animal sends on half of their genes to the next generation. So if you're thinking about a simple trait that's only, all we have to do is track this one gene going on into the next generation, you can set up a simple Punnett square. So you can put the sire here on the left and the dam on the top. In this example, both thought the sire and the dam are heterozygous for the coat color allele, uh, meaning they have one black allele or big E and one red allele or little e. So half of these squares, you draw out four squares, half of them are going to get the black allele from the sire. So we'll fill in half of these with the big E and then half of them with the little e. We'll go ahead and fill those out uh, throughout these four squares. Now it's important to note that each one of these squares has an equal chance of happening with every mating between these two animals. So there are four squares, so an equal chance would be each one would have to be one fourth or 25% likely to um, be the outcome of this mating. So we'll fill in the dam alleles now, the white E's. So half of the cells get a, a big E that's white from the dam and half of them get a little E that's white from the dam. So then you can look at the combinations um, 
between uh, the, the sire and the dam alleles. So this, this cell on the top um, left is a calf that would be uh, homozygous black. So it's got a capital E and a capital E, one from the sire, one from the dam. And that calf is 25% of the time that you mate a heterozygous dam to a heterozygous sire, you would expect 25% of the time that those animals would be homozygous black. Um, the same can be said for the recessive uh, red calves. So these calves are going to look red uh, because they have two copies of the little e. So 25% of the time, those calves would have um, the homozygous red on this mating. Now these two boxes here, you can actually combine because it doesn't matter if they get the black allele from the sire or the dam, as long as it carries one black allele, those animals will appear black, um, but they will also carry a red allele. So they will be heterozygous for the coat color gene. So you can combine those to 50%. And that's how you walk through a Punnett square. And I believe, Bailey, I believe that they um, will have an option for a Punnett Square example in their homework from today's session. Yes, that's correct. I hope you all paid good attention and are continuing to pay good attention because this will help you out significantly if some of you so choose to do the option number two on your assignment this month. Perfect. So you can make this more cut complicated. There's um, lots of things online about this. You can walk through um, the scenario of two genes that you want to think about um, the combination there, but this gives you an example of how to do it with just one. <clears throat> so unfortunately, it gets more complicated. Um, I guess maybe it's fortunate because that's, you know, job security for some of us, but um, Many of the traits that we are interested in tracking and that are economically relevant traits, traits that uh, influence the profitability of the genetics in your herd, are traits that are controlled by many genes, not just one, but many, tens, hundreds, we don't really even know for most of these genes. So calving ease, growth, fertility, carcass traits, anything that has an EPD, um, are traits that are polygenic. So poly meaning many, so it's many genes or more than one gene that's influencing that trait. And really, once you get to those traits, um, a Punnett square is too hard to track. And so we really need to use uh, an, an EPD in order to predict outcomes of a mating or a progeny expected from those animals. So an EPD is an expected progeny difference. These are estimates of the difference that you would expect in the performance for the progeny uh, for a specific trait given in units of that trait. Um, they're really comparisons. It's a way of comparing bull A to bull B and how you would expect their progeny to perform on average for a specific trait. And again, the red in units for that trait. So if we're talking about weaning weight, this would be red in pounds uh, of, of uh, red in pounds. So expected uh, weights at weaning uh, red in pounds. We take lots of information on animals on their pedigree about we know lots of things about breed we know lots of connections to other relatives in, in an animal's own progeny and we use all those records uh, to try and predict the epd of an animal and one of the biggest things that we need to do is factor out the environmental influences of a um of the phenotype uh, and also there are some some of the genetics of that that are influencing that phenotype are not heritable so we really need to get rid of all those confusing 
portions that are influencing the phenotype of that animal and zero in on just the part that can be passed on to their progeny. Because we're really interested in whether or not this animal will be good seed stock and have progeny that perform well. Um, so the difference between two EPDs for two different animals would tell you the expected average difference of their offspring if they were raised in similar environments. Okay, this is a, a slide from my good friend, Mr. Luke Bowman, uh, that tries to simplify some of this that we're talking about. So, so here's all the ingredients of an EPD. We have pedigree and breed information. We have an individual animal's performance. We have their progeny. When they have progeny, we'll start to influence an EPD. And genomic predictions is just additional information that tells us something about the EP of that animal. So the progeny performance is really the sweet spot where we can start to gain some accuracy in the EPD is when we start to get progeny records and lots of progeny records. Um, so this just depicts, um, uh, this helps us picture what we're trying to do with an EPD. So this is not real, <laughs> but let's pretend that we're looking at the two sets of chromosomes, the, two, the chromosome pair that influences a particular trait. And let's pretend that we know with infinite knowledge that there are four genes that influence that trait. And, um, and so, we can know with our infinite knowledge, we know that this animal has, um, is heterozygous at this location, and one gene would cause um, a two pound decrease in that trait, and this gene would cause a two pound increase for that trait. And here at this next spot, we've got a three pound increase and a three pound decrease. And you just go along, and you add up all these bits of pieces of information that we know are influencing the trait, and we come up with 10 total, plus 10 total for that trait. An EPD is their expected progeny difference. So that animal would have send on half of its genetics to the progeny. So you simply divide that by two, and the animal would have an EPD of five. Okay, so here is an example with three different bulls for a particular trait. So if we pretend that this trait is, um, let's say, Cabernet, and higher is better, then this bull up here that has an EPD of five has a, the highest number and would be the best bull for that particular trait where this bull here has an EPD of minus three and would be the worst bull for that particular trait. And this bull would be intermediate. So what I want you to take home from this slide is that there are, even the best bull has negative genes or genetic components to that trait along its DNA makeup. And even the worst bull has some good genes along the way in its DNA makeup. So that's how you end up with variation is because on average, this bull is gonna pass along a minus three to its progeny, but sometimes it might pass on more of the good genes than the bad genes. And the same is true for the good bull. On average, it's gonna pass on, you know, the genetic value of five to its progeny. But there would be times that it passes along more of the good genes and times that it passes along more of the bad genes. So here's another way to visualize that. We have bull A that has a weaning weight EPD of 60 pounds. And uh, you can see that there's variation across the 60 line here 
And the ought to be, if you have infinite calves, you would see a bell-shaped curve of the, ge the genetics that that bull passed on to its, its progeny. Um, and bull B, on average, he would pass along you know, a $70 value to, or a 70 pound value for weaning weight to its progeny. But again, there's variation. There would be calves that have more of the good genes and calves that have more of the bad genes. So one of the, um, the uh, misconceptions, I would say, I'll give away the answer here, is that if bull B has a weaning weight EPD of 70, that it would always have heavier calves at weaning than bull A. And that's not really true. If we look at this diagram, we can see that there are times that bull B might have passed along kind of a whole slug of its, its genes that weren't so good for, for growth. And there would be times that bull A would pass along a whole slug of genes that were great for growth. And so you can see that these are not as black and white as some would expect them to be. So uh, when it comes to EPDs, there's some things that we need to pay attention to. And you'll see this on herd book. You'll see it on um, printed certificates. Um, but it's, um, I wanted to take a little bit of time and just walk through these different uh, pieces of information that we want to think about when we're thinking about EPDs. And I put on dollar API and dollar TI here, but we're not going to get into that in this slide, so ignore that bit. So uh, if you go onto Herdbook and you look up two different animals uh, and their EPDs, this shows you I zoomed in on a couple of traits so we could really work through them. Um, so the EPD would be this top row, this top row here on this bowl. Uh, so this top bowl has an EPD for calving ease of 15.5. And the bottom bowl has an EPD of calving ease for 18.8. .8. And with calving ease, the higher the, the EPD, the better the less dystocia or um, less um, assistance is needed with their first calf heifers bred to that animal. Uh, this next number down is the possible change and that's somewhat new on herd buck. It's gone on, I think maybe, maybe we're around two years um, that we've added possible change. And that's really, it's, it's um, directly related to the accuracy of the animal, but once you learn how to use it, it's a little bit more intuitive. So accuracy can be how, how much information, how confident are we in the EPD that it's not going to move a whole bunch. And it's directly related to this possible change, which gives us a window, a very specific window, where we could expect um, certain movement. So what do I mean by that? So if we take an EPD plus or minus the possible change, we would expect, again, these EPDs are predictions. So if we had infinite knowledge about this goal, um, then the possible change would go to zero and the accuracy would go somewhere close to one but we don't have infinite knowledge. So if we take this bowl at an accuracy of 0.91, it's possible change for calving ease is 0.7. So we subtract 0.7 from its EPD of 15.5, and we add 0.7 from its EPD of 15.5. You see that down here. So I took 15.5, and I subtracted 0 0.7 and I added 0 0.7 to 15.5. And I got this window from 14.8 to 16.2. And that window tells us that two thirds of the time, if we had infinite knowledge of this goal, its final EPD would land somewhere between 14.8 and 16.2. Now, 
two thirds is the majority of the time, but it's not impossible that a bull could let its, its final EPD, if we had infinite knowledge, would land outside of that window, right? One third of the time, we should expect that, which is also kind of frequent. <laughs> so people get upset when EPDs move, even on high accuracy animals, and this pull up here will be considered a high accuracy animal. And what I think possible change helps us understand is the range of movement that is expected and um, how frequent we should expect that kind of movement. So you can actually take two possible change units and get 95% um, of the time that true value will land within two possible change units of the EPD. So down here is a bull, a younger bull, whose accuracy is lower, um, 0.22. So the possible change is higher. So we would expect a wider spread, um, uh, or we would set a wider spread for that window uh, where you would see two thirds of the time the EPD lands between. So again, you take 18.8 the EPD plus or minus the possible change. So minus 6.08 from 18.8 gives you 12.72. Or if you add 6.8 to 18.8, you get 24.88. So two thirds of the time, that infinite knowledge, we would expect this holds. Cabernese EPD to land somewhere between 12.72 and 24.88. And that's quite a spread. <laughs> um, and, but that um, helps to kind of understand the risk associated with this bull. And there's actually, you know, some, um, those are important things to think about when you're selecting what bulls to use in your operation or if you're advising bulls for your customers to be using. And um, you might say this bull with the higher accuracy uh, EPD is a better option because I feel like, you know, we, we've really kind of locked in on its calving ease. And that might be true if you don't want to risk um, Having ease, or uh, if you really want something pretty dependable. But the problem is, um, you know, if you're going for genetic progress, the highest you expect this top bowl to get would be 16, just over 16 for having ease. Or if you're really looking to push um, or make big improvements in having ease, then the bowl down here actually has potential. To, to be a whopper of a Cavanese bull, um, but it also might not be such a Cavanese bull. So you kind of have to think through all those nuances. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice on her book with the EPD reports would be this percentile ranking, and that's uh, symbolized by the percentage sign here. So percentile ranking just tells you how that animal ranks within the same breed population. So purebred semitals to, are ranked against other purebred semitals, but they are not ranked against hybrids. And full bloods are ranked against other full bloods, but they're not ranked against simbred. So it's within those populations. A smaller number is better. Uh, so you can think of it as the top um, fifth percentile. This top bowl would be the top fifth percentile for Cavanese, and this bottom bowl would be in the top one percentile for Cavanese, where it would be in the bottom 90th percentile. So um, not a great bowl for me to read. So how did genomics factor into this? Uh, genomics, this is a really simple way of thinking about genomics. It's trading time for money. Genomics simply add information to what we know about an animal's um, EPD. 
So an animal would start off life uh, getting an estimate, a pedigree estimate from the dam and the sire EP. For the most part, there's some nuances here. But eventually with infinite in information, we would find that animal's true progeny difference. And it's not always smack dab in between the sire and the dam, again, because of that random shuffling and we get we might get more of the good traits or more of the um, horror traits from the DNA. So again, going back to our DNA sequence and along the, this chain of nucleotides, there are specific um, DNA variances or changes, and those are called uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, it's a SNP. And so what we do with DNA, a lot of DNA testing, not all of it, is we're looking for these very specific places along the genomic sequence where there is variation and that variation tells us something about the performance of that animal or the parentage of that animal or maybe simple traits um, that are controlled by those genes. So adding, uh, taking a genomic test is um, one way to think about that is it's similar to adding a certain number of progeny records to that that animal's information that goes into the genetic evaluation. And this table shows you the progeny equivalence. We don't really have time to go through all the table, but uh, so a genomic test could be like adding 25 having any scores to what you know about an animal or 22 birth weights uh, on their progeny to what you know about an animal. And the beauty of genomics is that you can do it at a month of age or you can do it right after birth and have have an animal that's basically had a year of, of progeny added to its information it, you know before it's sired its own progeny what when it's a calf itself and that really adds tremendous information um, to what we can do with those EPDs. So one of the things that I've heard is that people don't want to do DNA testing. This was actually from a, a conference where I heard this exact thing, exact thing from somebody in the audience. He said his best bull out of his best genetics had um, EPDs that were worse after he did genomic testing. So he didn't believe in the DNA test at all. And so the question for you to ponder would be, would cattle have always have better EPDs with genomics? And the answer is if the DNA test is working the way we want it to work, that animal has an equal chance of improving the EPD value or um, getting worse in the EPD value, but the accuracy of the EPD should always increase. And you know what? We're just, we're at the seven o'clock hour. So Chip and Bailey, I'm wondering if we should pause and not do economic indexes or if you want me to charge on. Well, um, I'll leave that up to you. You have a better sense of how much longer you have. I think relative to their immediate needs of knowledge, I think you've really hit that relative to the EPDs and genomics. Clearly, we know the importance of an economic index. And so um, if it's something you can knock out in a few minutes, great. If, if not. OK, I'll try and summarize quickly. <laughs> hey, but yeah, no doubt. Yeah, right. So um, an economic index, uh, we have two of them. They take all the EPDs for economically relevant traits. These are traits that directly influence the profit of um, a beef cattle cycle. And it adds um, cost and prices associated with inputs and outputs for the beef, entire beef cattle cycle. And it comes up with one simple um, figure that estimates profit. 
Uh, so we have two indexes. One is the API or all purpose index, and that's best used if, uh, if the genetics will be used to generate replacement heifers. But it's not just a maternal index. It also keeps terminal um, traits in it, assuming that a portion of the animals will be used as replacement heifers, but the rest of their calves will be harvested. And a terminal index is best used when all of the calves would be harvested. So I won't go through this in detail, um, but this graphic shows you the all-purpose index. And so what it simply does is it takes all the traits that have input, that, are, that have costs associated with them, that are um, you have to pay expenses associated with them at both the cow-calf feedlot and packing plant, and all the output traits. And it takes all that information at one time, along with economic figures, to come up with one dollar figure that signifies profit. And I won't go through the, um, the questions and just get straight to the take-home messages. So phenotype is influenced by genetics. Some of those genetics are heritable that can be passed on to the next um, uh, generation. Some of them are not heritable. And it's just a combination of that animal's unique genetic makeup. Phenotype is also influenced by environment. So EPDs are the most accurate way to get at the um, portion of the phenotype that can be passed along to the next generation. So the part uh, that um, can be inherited and hence select for to make progress in the next generation. And it is much more accurate than anything else that exists. So if there's an EPD for a trait, use the EPD for the trait. Genomics simply add accuracy to an EPD. It's not magic. It's, it's just more information to that EPD, but you can do it early in an animal's life. And economic selection tools is the best way to balance all of this information and focus on one number, which is profit. It's simply the most accurate way to get at profitability and it balances um, traits that maybe need some balance. So remember, big take home, the decision you make this year can influence your genetics in 2036. Think about what you will be doing in 2036 and how much will change in your life and um, use that as incentive to make this an important decision and one that you study. So with that, I'll wrap that up. And sorry, it went a little long. Oh my goodness, but geez, I was trying to cover it all. So any questions? At this point, I'm not seeing many, and I'm gonna guess, Jackie, um, a lot of folks are ruminating over what you've told them. Um, here's what I'm gonna suggest. First of all, I will tell you, I've heard more genetics talks than I can count. And this is clearly one of the better talks to really make some remarkably complex topics pretty digestible. And so for those of you who, you know, maybe you're a little older, you've, you've got some experience, maybe some of this resonated pretty quick, but I'm guessing some of you who are younger, you, you might want to take time to, to listen to this again when it gets posted. And I'd encourage some of the older ones Make sure mom and dad get to hear this. Maybe your FFA advisor, share this with them. This is going to be something that is really valuable for a lot of folks uh, to boil down some of these topics. And so um, if there are questions, clearly throw them out now. Um, Jackie, of course, put her contact info up on the screen along with how you get to the, a couple of places of very useful content. Um, but also, just like we did this week, if some questions come to mind um, in the coming days as you're thinking through this, share those with us, and certainly we'll, we'll either either Dr. Atkins can tackle them directly uh, with your info on the screen, um, or we can tackle them in the next SBC call. So, Jackie, thank you a bunch. Oh, I got one. 
Oh, just comments from, yes, Ms. Audrey, it was excellent. So thank you very much. Um, Minnesota nice, that's what they call that. Um, yeah. And correct too, yeah. Um, I'm from so, North Dakota, I totally get that Minnesota nice deal. Yes, yes you do. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna be quiet. And I think Bailey's got a few minutes of explaining and then we'll get you off this call here pretty directly. Jackie, anything last before we turn it back over to Bailey? No, really um, heartfelt uh, open door for sending in questions. And, you know, we love to talk about these kind of things. So um, don't be shy and we'd be happy to answer anything further. All right, Bailey, it's you. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Jackie. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you, Chip. So, Briefly, I apologize, we don't have this up on the screen for you all, but you all will be getting this in an email um, quite shortly when this call wraps up. But your assignments for this month, you again have two options, and we mixed it up a little bit more for you this month. So your first option is a more traditional writing prompt, a report like last month, and the rubric, as you'll see, is very much similar to last month as well so if you prefer that format then you're more than welcome to stick to that more traditional style if you prefer we also added a bit more of a hands-on exercise and that is your second option this month with that you will be doing a sample dna extraction and you'll be using fruit for this so uh, the directions recommend a strawberry if for some reason you can't find strawberries, you are more than welcome to use a similar fruit. I imagine something like grapes or kiwi would also work equally well. Um, and then with that, you'll also be required to do a bit of a worksheet. There's one option for juniors and one for the older folks. Um, so you all can check out those and decide which of those you'd like to do. Remember, these assignments are mandatory. There are some of you that I still have not received December assignments for. If that's you and you know that's you and you're just remembering that, please get those to me. We do not want to have to make any disqualifications or other issues that arise with such things. So if you could please get those to me within the next week or two, that would be great. And this assignment is due January 15th. So make sure you're getting those assignments turned in on time and we'll get those graded and back to you quickly as well. Any other comments that I'm forgetting, Chip? I think you nailed it. And yes, they are mandatory. A reminder, what happens if you don't follow through in the commitments that you signed up for? Um, clearly, these are your cattle. You're paying to feed them. You'll get your money, but we will remove any ability to compare how they did with the other cattle. So uh, understanding how they fared will not be available to you. We don't have any desire to do that. That's not our goal here. We want to enjoy the learning process. So, so help us out. And if you're behind on those assignments and we get it, it's been the holidays, it's a busy time. We hope those were a blessing to you. And so now that we're past those, hopefully we can get caught up and get those done. Perfect. Well, with that, I think we are done for this evening. And I look forward to getting those assignments from you all in the next couple weeks and we'll talk again soon so thank you again Jackie and thank you Chip have a good evening good night everybody thank you all